What's up everyone? Today I'm going to present to you the libertarian case for Bitcoin. In the early days of Bitcoin, there was really two main groups of people that were getting involved. That was your nerdy, more tech savvy kind of people. And then the other group were your libertarians or libertarian minded people. So why is that? Morning. First and foremost, I think libertarians were immediately excited because um, as soon as you start to look into Bitcoin, you start to see, okay, this is a private competing currency against the already existing fiat currencies of the world. Most libertarian uh, type people are already um, probably well aware of the ideas of sound economics and uh, competing currencies and a lot of them were probably already involved with uh, precious metals gold and silver or other valuable metals because they would maintain their value against uh, fiat currency depreciation and inflation now what do I mean when I say sound money well let's take a look over 2300 years ago a Greek philosopher student of Plato teacher of Alexander the Great, Aristotle, gave us the definition of money, and he gave us some qualities that he determined made a good money. All right, so what are those qualities? First, it must be durable. Money must stand the test of time and the elements. It must not fade, corrode, or change through time. Second, it must be portable. Money should hold a high amount of worth relative to its weight and size. All right, next, it must be divisible. Money should be relatively easy to separate and recombine without affecting its fundamental characteristics. An extension of this idea is that the item should be fungible. Right, Dictionary.com describes fungible as, especially of goods, being of such nature or kind as to be freely exchangeable or replaceable in whole or in part for another of like nature or kind. So if I give you a $1 bill, for example, you don't have to give me back the exact dollar bill to pay me back. It could be any other $1 bill. That's fungibility. Fourth, it must have intrinsic value. This value of money should be independent of any other object and contained in the money itself. And it's not listed here, but there is another quality that should be listed, and that is scarce. And money should be scarce. So if we look at various types of money, we can look and see which ones make the best one. Starting over here with oil, if it's durable, uh, it's not as portable. It's way more difficult for me to try to hand you a barrel of oil, um, so that doesn't necessarily make a good money. Um, land, for instance, is uh, much less divisible and not portable. Um, looking at uh, fiat, paper or fiat currency, what the government decrees is supposed to be money. Um, it's less durable as it's paper, but um, portable, yes. Divisible, yes. Intrinsic value, that's a big problem right now with with the uh, fiat currency and with the dollar. There's literally nothing backing it, so it doesn't have any intrinsic value uh, aside from um, if it gets to a certain point you could possibly use it as stuffing or as uh, fire starters something like that that's its intrinsic value the value of the paper itself um, and then also talking about scarcity fiat paper is becoming so much less scarce we're gonna have massive amounts of printing going on so the scarcity issue is a big deal with the fiat uh, paper money 
Uh, gold is a very good money. It's always been a very good money for thousands of years. Humans have used it. It's durable, portable, divisible, has intrinsic value. It can be uh, used in jewelry. It can be used in uh, uh, industry production. And gold is relatively scarce, so um, it makes it very good money. Um, looking at uh, Bitcoin, all of these things are met. Uh, Bitcoin is very durable uh, as long as you know how to protect your private keys. Um, it, it has a very robust network. Uh, it has the most powerful computing network uh, the world has ever seen. Likely more powerful than the, all of the top supercomputers in the world combined because of how many computing uh, computers are working together to protect the network. It's portable. It's easily transferable. You can tr you can send Bitcoin across borders uh, to anybody in the world in a very short amount of time. It is divisible. After the decimal point, there are eight more spaces, so you can get down to. Um, start talking about the Satoshis, each decimal place, each uh, single unit, eight decimal places over. Um, and then the intrinsic value, that's a nice topic to talk about with uh, Bitcoin. Um, if you consider that um, computing power has uh, value, that a secured network has value, um, then it, it, I would say that it does have a um, very important intrinsic value and with there only going to be ever 21 million bitcoins in the world ever that is probably the most scarce currency in existence so far hey hey the dukes are trying to corner the market they know something i can feel it let's get in on it Good. not yet Almost. Yeah, to me, to me. Now. Yeah. 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 The other part of uh, what we're talking about, libertarians being excited initially, is that Bitcoin was a stateless money. It, it uh, was created without any um, taxation. It was created freely. Um, and outside of any state, no state had anything to do, as far as anybody knows, um, with the creation of Bitcoin. Um, some people might speculate that it is possible that maybe the government or some uh, world banking interests might have created it, um, trying to get everybody to switch over to digital currencies. That is another topic for another day. Um, for today, talking about private competing currencies, right? Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek was talking about this um, long ago already, all right? Uh, he wrote a pamphlet in 1974 called The Denationalization of Money, all right? Um, Hayek's proposal, he argues that if only government obstacles were removed, the free market would provide the optimal quantity and variety of monetary products, just as the forces of competition lead to low prices and superior quality in every other line. So too would competition in the fiat money industry lead to monies that were infinitely better than their government produced counterparts. For example, the private monies would be far more stable and their purchasing power would be harder to counterfeit and would be available in more convenient denominations. All right. Um, if you're interested in reading this, it's a great read. The denationalization of money. All right. Looking over here, look at some of the... Uh, the chapters and some of the topics in the table of contents. Free traded money, proposal for more practical uh, than utopian European currency, free trade and banking, preventing government from concealing depreciation, which is a big deal. Um, let's see here, competition currency not discussed by economists, initial advantages of government monopoly in money, government certificate of metal weight, Appearance of paper money, political and technical possibilities of controlling paper money, monopoly of money has buttressed government power. Uh, persistent abuse of the government, 
prerogative history is largely inflation engineered by government early middle ages deflation local or temporary um, and much more in this all right this is about is it a hundred something pages 102 pages so highly recommend I'll put a link in the comments below for the denationalization of money by Friedrich Hayek other aspects to consider about Bitcoin are that it is permissionless and uncensorable. All right, contrast that with your bank. If you even just travel out of state and you make a purchase from the next state over, the bank can freeze your account with your money and deny you access. Uh, all right, if the bank goes under and they and they hold your money in their accounts while they go into bankruptcy. Um, that is not going to be your money anymore. That's going to be assets that go into the uh, into the bank's bankruptcy. And so, um, talking about um, bank runs and the possibility that um, not everybody that has deposits uh, across the country will be able to um, take out their money. All right. So um, and uncensorable. So if um, Say you're say you're a Iranian American. You were born here, but you have family in Iran, and you wanted to um, send your mother uh, some some money so that she could pay her bills and eat over in the other part of the world somewhere else, um, because. Uh, this state here doesn't like Iran. They can say that that's terrorist financing and then deny you the ability to um, send that money and possibly put sanctions on you as a result of trying to do so. So that is not the case. It's not possible to stop the transfer um, of Bitcoin that way. It is permissionless, uncensorable, uh, and borderless. All right, another favorable aspect of Bitcoin that libertarians like is that it is unconfiscatable, all right? How is it unconfiscatable? Um, there are certain improvement protocols that are made to the, the coding of Bitcoin, and they're called Bitcoin Improvement Protocols, BIP numbers, and then um, the network combined uh, will choose whether one is something that everybody finds usable or not. And so um, Bitcoin Improvement Protocol number 38 deals with encryption of your private keys. All right, so an example of a, of a way to protect this would be um, say you use paper wallets. Paper wallets are also a good way for self-custody, which is another reason to favor Bitcoin over um, fiat currencies. All right, you can basically be your own Swiss bank in that you control your finances and who they go to and the protection of them, etc. So on this paper wallet, what you'll see is there is a um, QR code for the public address and then there is a QR code for the private address or the private key. Um, and so if you just have a regular standard paper wallet and you hide that in your safe, if somebody's able to get to your safe, all they need to do is use that private key QR code and then they can spend your Bitcoin. All right, with an encrypted wallet, as soon as somebody tries to scan your private key QR code, instead, what they're going to be getting is a little prompt for your password. And if you use a strong enough password, um, nobody can access your Bitcoin and spend it with your private key. So you could literally print up stacks, reams worth of your paper wallet with your public and private address um, shown on it and you could distribute them in the air down a parade um, as long as you have that encryption on your private key unless somebody can figure out your password it's useless to, to anyone so a thief coming in and finding your paper wallet still won't do them any good you would literally need to kidnap somebody to hold them and torture them to get them to re release the um, password for the encryption on the private key. Okay, next you got the ideas of uh, demand versus uh, scarcity uh, of supply. So just basic economics. Um, currently, 
there are millions of people using Bitcoin all over the world in different countries. That demand um, will likely either stay the same or continue to grow, especially in the light of seeing how much fiat currency printing is going on right now. All right, money printer go burr. The people that are having to use that fiat currency are going to recognize the inflation problems as they start to see their money be able to buy less and less of the regular goods and products that they would be looking for. Those prices are going to go up. And so the demand is likely going to increase as the supply is continually decreasing. All right, built into the uh, protocol for Bitcoin every four years it goes through a halving. The amount that is generated of the remaining 21 million um, is decreasing every four years. So prior to this May, the first four months of this year, there were about probably 1,800-ish Bitcoin being generated by mining all over the world for the whole day. All right, currently, after the halving this past May of 2020, the amount of Bitcoin that's being generated is 900 per day. All right, in 2024, you're gonna be looking at 450 generated every day. In 2028, you're looking at 225 generated every day. In 2032, you'll be looking at 112, 20, 36, you'll be looking at 56 generated every day. And then, so, the last Bitcoin is estimated to be mined somewhere around the year 2140. For most people alive today, it's just going to continue decreasing the amount of supply that's generated. All right, as the demand grows for it with a decreasing supply, that's just basic economics that's gonna tell you the price is gonna go up. All right, um, if you have decreasing supply at the same time as you have increasing demand, that's why people are estimating um, just insane prices for Bitcoin, going up to 100,000 per unit. Or um, a great video on YouTube if you wanna watch is Bitcoin $10 million in game. There are um, uh, estimates based on sound reasoning showing that uh, one Bitcoin could be worth $10 million in, in the future. So the economic reasons, demand versus scarcity. Maybe one of the last reasons we'll talk about is anonymity and privacy in finance versus surveillance and financial tracking. The banks and governments of the world are looking towards being able to track every single financial transaction in the world. They want to be able to tax you at every single transaction, multiple uh, parties being taxed, every possible way. So they're looking at doing like a, a US digital dollar and they're, they're gonna say that's a central bank digital currency and they're gonna want, it's not gonna be decentralized, it's not gonna be uh, permissionless, it's not stateless, it's not gonna be unconfiscatable, it won't be borderless, it won't be any of the good qualities of, of Bitcoin as money, but it'll be a digital unit of currency that they're gonna be able to say that you can spend it the same way. And so if, if you don't understand these, these sound money principles, you might be fooled into thinking, oh yeah, let me get that let me get that stimulus payment of that uh, digital dollar. Just you know, email it to me. Just send it on over. The bad thing about that is that if they do get to use a digital currency that way, they're going to track everything. So you'll have no privacy. Um, already, uh, finances are highly tracked and surveilled. Um, you can't hardly do anything without your bank knowing what's going on with it. So Bitcoin allows you to remove the middleman. You can just go from directly from yourself to your um, um, whoever you're going to be buying from or um, you know selling to or trading with uh, you can cut out the middleman just have it be from party A to party B um, currently uh, Bitcoin is only sued anonymous you can still find out who people are um, and that's largely because the state is trying to make it uh, so that they can track everybody. They're doing a lot of anti-money laundering and know your customer requirements on all of the exchanges that are offering Bitcoin so that they can know exactly who's purchasing and then try to tax and regulate it. All right, to me that's their last ditch effort at being able to control the, the financial world 
if we get to the point where Bitcoin transactions will be completely private and anonymous, and there are already improvement protocols being suggested, multiple ones that are going to be increasing the level of privacy for Bitcoin. Um, additionally, if that wasn't enough, there are additional uh, um, cryptocurrencies that you can use that are more private. Um, I think the, in my opinion, the one that is the most useful uh, as far as privacy is probably Monero. Um, and so they've done a lot. It's completely redesigned. It's not they copied the Bitcoin code and they they created Monero from scratch with privacy in mind. And so that's going to be a big deal as, as the world starts going towards um, uh, financial surveillance and social crediting scores like they're doing in China. Um, you're going to want to be able to protect your privacy and stateless cryptocurrencies that offer private transactions will be wildly popular as soon as, as soon, the more the more the state pushes for control and surveillance and tracking the more people will desire to be free and the more the demand for private transactions will go up so long term best thing that could happen is private transactions untraceable transactions there's arguments to say that, oh my gosh, they're going to enable criminals. Currently, we have tons of regulations in, in the fiat world, and that is not stopping uh, criminals at all. In fact, you can catch banks like Chase Bank with their ships just transporting tons of cocaine. And, and they're getting away with doing that using you know state money and current banking systems. So... Ultimately, the freedom to transact financially is a, is a huge deal. I just want to summarize by saying that this video is not meant to be financial advice. I don't want to tell you what to do with your money. Instead, what I would say is research Bitcoin. Research it. Go look it up. Read the white paper. Read Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. There is a global war on cash going on. We have reached that point in history where it is within the grasp, within the vision of world governments to once and for all eradicate cash. Cash being the ultimate peer-to-peer, -peer, transparent, private form of money that allows individuals to transact locally within a community is now being eradicated in favor of digital transactions on platforms that allow for surveillance, control, confiscation, and negative interest rates. And all of these things will follow very closely once cash is no longer part of the picture. That's their hope. Hopefully, you'll join in me in ruining that dream. <laughs> in these currency wars, there is one force that stands neutral as a safe haven, as an exit strategy, as an opportunity for people to say, you know what, you go ahead, I'm going to opt out. And that's Bitcoin. Bitcoin is now standing at the precipice of becoming the safe haven asset for billions of people around the world who for the first time will have the opportunity to say, I see where you're going, I don't believe in your nationalist bullshit, I see the exit sign, I'm gonna go this way, and leave, and opt out from these experiments. This isn't about nation states anymore. This isn't about who adopts Bitcoin first, or who adopts cryptocurrencies first, because the internet is adopting cryptocurrencies, and the internet is the world's largest economy, the most populous economy and it is the first transnational economy, and it needs a transnational currency. To summarize, what we've really done is we've inverted the very basic and most fundamental equation of currency, which is that from millennia until the year 2008, sovereignty defined currency. Sovereignty was the basis upon which currency could be created, and that currency allowed that sovereignty to be expressed. The monopolistic control of currency is the basis of sovereignty. And now the internet has a currency, 
and the internet is going to use that currency to create sovereignty. After 2008, currency creates sovereignty. And the internet has its own currency, which means the internet has purchasing power, which means the internet has economic freedom, which means the internet can exert that economic freedom in a post-nationalist way, in a way that ignores borders and makes the nation state not obsolete, but simply less relevant. Because when an Egyptian blogger can not only blog about the revolution, but also fund that revolution in Bitcoin, and they can connect with people from all around the world who share their ideals for self-determination and freedom, they are expressing their own sovereignty as an individual, and they are expressing the sovereignty of their community through the use of that currency. So this is the world we now live in, a world in which currencies can coexist, and where currency and its user adoption creates sovereignty. That's basically what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. Read anything that you can, study it, and, and make an informed decision for yourself. What do you think? Am I missing anything? Are there any other reasons why you as a libertarian-minded person might have been attracted to Bitcoin initially? Are you a hodler? Are you holding on for dear life? Me personally, I used to be, but uh, unfortunately I lost all my Bitcoin in a tragic boating accident. Thanks for watching, you guys. Peace.